we continue with the morning session and the next speaker is Michael from Universidad de Sao Paulo and he will talk about multisymplectic geometry and classical field theory. Michael. Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, I would thank the organizers of this nice meeting for having invited me and giving me the opportunity to speak about a long-term project that I've been starting about 15 years ago in, uh, at Sao Paulo, more or less motivated by one of my students. I started it and uh, now there's quite a number of students who have already finished their PhD thesis. And I would like to give an overview of uh, where we stand more or less with this project at the present time. So. Either it goes or it, yeah, here we go. So that's a rough overview of the contents. Uh, I'll give a short, short introduction, motivation for some of the aspects that are important in this respect. Some, uh, then the second chapter is, more, uh, is the central part of the talk. And uh, in the third, I want to comment briefly also on a different approach which is called the covariant functional formalism um, and the combination that you can do with the, uh, between these two approaches, which is probably what gives the best results. And I close up with an outlook. I would like to say I have a lot of slides here, so if I go a bit fast, don't worry, these slides will be available afterwards on the site of the, of the conference, so everybody who's interested can have a look, a calm, uh, with, with more time into this, okay? Okay, so um, first I would like to start with some comments on uh, uh, the Hamiltonian formalism and quantization. Um, notion of quantization is somewhat vague. It's been used over decades uh, uh, to denote any process that for a certain class of dynamical systems will allow us to uh, deduce in some sense the quantum theory from the corresponding classical theory. The reason being that usually we understand the classical theory much better. But uh, one should say right away, uh, this procedure is a little bit ad hoc and it certainly cannot be understood as a functor. In particular, it may be ambiguous, there may be different quantum theories corresponding to the same classical theories. Now, the issue of quantization is not only fundamental for mechanics, it's just as fundamental for field theory. Field theory means uh, is a common framework for things like hydrodynamics, fluid dynamics, uh, um, electromagnetism, Young-Mills theory, gravitation, Einstein's general relativity, that is, and so on. These are all examples of field theories, typically dealing with systems with an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Well, the first quantization procedures uh, were proposed by Dirac that consists of just of a set of uh, correspondence rules between simple observables, like position, momentum, energy, and so on. And as much as possible, um, you want to preserve the algebraic relations between them. It's not possible uh, completely. You cannot make this really into an algebra homomorphism. That's the content of the no-go theorem of Gronold von Hove. Um, but uh, parts of the observables uh, should have a correspondence. And uh, what you learn in quantum mechanics courses is those few examples where this really works and uh, leads to an exact solution of the system. Uh, everybody learns about the harmonic oscillator and the Kepler problem and these things in these quantum mechanics courses. And uh, that's really where this procedure, this pragmatic procedure really worked. Um, for field theory, the uh, story there is much uh, less uh, uh, successful, there's practically only one theory for which it really does work, and that's the theory of free fields. Free meaning that there is no interaction. But even there, if you look at the uh, uh, usual way they do it, and when they use Hamiltonian methods, um, uh, the procedure is a bit ugly because you have to uh, require some Cauchy surface in space time. You choose it, uh, and then uh, a relativistic covariance is lost, 
because of that choice and you have quite a lot of hard work to recover it in a subsequent step. Um, when you want to do uh, incorporate interaction, canonical quantization fails, fails miserably, really. And this failure can, cannot be avoided. There's a famous no-go theorem in quantum field theory known as Hawkes theorem, which states that if you have non-trivial interactions, you cannot implement time evolution by means of a unitary operator. In Hilbert space, there is no one parameter group of unitary operators that interpolates between the different representations of the canonical commutation relations at different times. So there is no such thing as a Hamiltonian operator in field theory. That's a fact of life, and um, it's a waste of time to go against no-go theorems. So it's a good idea to try and do something else. Well, many physicists have taken, out a, uh, taken a different way out. They, in somewhat in despair, they gave up thinking about quantum theory in terms of operators in Hilbert space, uh, operators, observable states, and so on. And they look only at amplitudes, no? in particular scattering amplitudes. Since Heisenberg's S-matrix approach, which has been uh, um, then further developed, um, by, basically by Feynman, pertinent quantization procedure there, you just you write these amplitudes as integrals over spaces of classical configurations. That's known as path integrals in mechanics or as functional integrals in field theory. That's the sum over histories method that uh, Feynman proposed and developed. That has the advantage it doesn't break relativistic covariance. Uh, another great advantage is that, it, um, that you can handle local symmetries. Uh, Fadeev, Popov, Baker, it's, it's, this is a long story. But the conceptual framework uh, gets, um, is pretty poor because you lose, you don't know what observables or states are really in, this, in that theory. You know what scattering amplitudes are and that's all. But what is the Hilbert space of states um, of, that, of such a field theory? Well, nobody has a really a, a, a very good idea about that, except for free fields, where Fock has told us in 19, back in 1932 what it is, but um, in interacting theories, uh, this is not clear at all. And then there's deformation quantization, perhaps the most recent approach, uh, which uh, uh, aims at controlling the structural modifications in the algebra of observables, that, uh, these modifications that come up in, during the quantization process. This has originally been developed for mechanics. The adaptation to field theory for, of deformation quantization is largely an open subject. A big challenge for the future, for the near future. But that adaptation should pr uh, respect principles of field theory which do not have analogs in mechanics and that is covariance and locality. What does that mean? The, princip the principle of covariance just means Lorentz covariance in the context of special relativity, or when you want to couple to external gravitational fields, that's general covariance in the context of general relativity. This, the statement essentially that results of physical experiments do not depend on the coordinates or reference frames in which you, uh, which you used for their description. And the principle of locality or microcausality is that results of physical experiments performed in regions of space-time, which are causally disconnected, uh, are independent, do not influence each other. So that should appear somewhere in these procedures. If you look at uh, relativistic, in, in, even in classical field theory, how is that implemented? Um, in the Lagrangian formulation, um, this is uh, clearly implemented. The, requirement of local co of covariance is implemented, um, but not in the Hamiltonian approach. In the, in the Hamiltonian approach, you use Cauchy data, uh, initial, you quantize initial data, and, um, um, or, or you, you use initial data, and as soon as you do that, uh, co covariance has been lost. And the issue of locality is not even addressed. You don't find a single book of classical field theory which discusses locality. You find it in quantum field theory, but what is the classical limit of that? Nobody discusses that usually. I should mention this is a problem of relativistic field theories. Oh, sorry. Uh, in non-relativistic field theories, there are examples of that. 
this problem does not arise because you have the absolute, Newton's absolute time, so you, you have a preferred choice of Cauchy surfaces, and you have, uh, uh, and there is no principle of locality because you have unlimited speed of propagation. That's the typical case of Schrodinger's quantum mechanics. There's no locality issues in Schrodinger's quantum mechanics. In, in quantum field theory, amazingly, these requirements of covariance and locality, they are incorporated from the start. And it gets even worse, they, oh sorry, here that uh, there's no natural place for Cauchy data. In fact, the Cauchy problem does not exist in quantum field theory. There's, uh, in interacting field theories, there is a, a problem with restricting those distributions to Cauchy surfaces. These restrictions are not well defined, so you can't even formulate a Cauchy problem. So you see that the conceptual framework uh, is sort of in, in classical and in quantum field theory is a bit di uh, is different. So f doing a Hamiltonian formalism in classical field theory, the usual way is not the right way to do it. You have to think of something better in order to get closer to the quantization process so that you don't get obstructed by, by transitions uh, uh, in logic or transitions in, in philosophy when you go from the classical to the quantum world. So the suggestion is forget the usual non-covariant Hamiltonian formulation. What is needed is a manifestly covariant Hamiltonian formalism in which locality is built in right from the start. That's the goal. And there are two approaches which have pr uh, proved fruitful for this. One is this multisymplectic formalism that I want to discuss a bit, and the other is called the covariant functional formalism. Each of them has its own strengths and drawbacks, but the best results are obtained when you combine the two. So, the multisymplectic formalism it's, is based on methods of differential geometry in a purely finite dimensional setting. And that makes it easily uh, mathematically rigorous. In its coordinate form, it goes back to the work of De Donda and Weil in the 1930s. There's a paper of Hermann Weil in 1935 which clearly speaks about these multi-momenta that appear in field theory. The idea is simply that uh, in field theory, instead of, for each position variable, instead of a single momentum variable that is conjugate to it, you have n momentum variables and those, those are called multi-momenta. Um, I'll show a formula in a minute uh, to explain that a little bit better. n here is simply this, the dimension of space-time, usually for but you could, for, other mo for model reasons, also consider other values of n. The geometric form, global, comes much later. It started to appear gradually since the 1970s. It introduces the concept of a sort of multi-phase space, but it was only realized uh, uh, considerably later, including by one of our colleagues who is here in the audience, from whom I learned this, that it, this really comes in two variants, which um, I have no better name, ordinary and extended multi-phase space. I will explain it in a minute what that means. And the covariant functional formalism is something else. That's intrinsically infinite dimensional. And the idea is to replace the space of Cauchy data by the space, in, in, in quotation marks, of solutions of the equations of motion. That's what usually is referred to as covariant phase space. And uh, the main advantage of that approach is that it is extremely similar to the symplectic formalism in mechanics. But unfortunately, it's inherently infinite dimensional and therefore very hard to handle mathematically in, with rigor. The, the, the many important techniques that are needed for doing that are only uh, gradually being developed or have been developed recently. Okay, so um, multi-symplectic geometry, therefore, is, uh, is an area which uh, should play a role similar to that uh, played by symplectic geometry in, for mechanics. Multi-symplectic geometry should do the same job for field theory. So let me start a bit with analogies with symplectic geometry. Everyone, uh, this one I can start, uh, I can pass rapidly. It's just to fix the notation, essentially. So normally, in, uh, 
the dynamics and classical mechanics governed by ordinary differential equations. Typically, you start out from a configuration space. I will denote those coordinates, local coordinates there by QI. Then you pass to a velocity space, as physicists sometimes call it, which is a tangent bundle, and then to phase space, which is a cotangent bundle. The Lagrangian formalism li lives in the tangent bundle, the uh, Hamiltonian in the cotangent bundle. And to pass from one to the other, you use the famous Legendre transformation, which converts velocities into momento by, uh, momenta by this formula uh, that you take the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocities in geometrically invariant form. It's called the fiber derivative. And the symplectic structure on phase space in such coor induced coordinates on cotangent bundles, just given by this uh, well-known formula. Uh, now, there's one observation which will be important to, um, for making the transition to field theory later on, is that this is only for non-autonomous. This is only for autonomous systems. If you are dealing with non-autonomous systems, where the Lagrangian, for example, depends explicitly on time, then sorry, sometimes I hit the wrong button here. Then you have to replace the tangent bundle by a copy of it, uh, by the Cartesian product with the real lines, which incorporates the time as coordinate, as the domain. And for the Hamiltonian, it's the product R times T star Q. And of course, R times T star Q is no longer a symplectic manifold, but rather a contact manifold. But uh, an old trick already uh, introduced by Elie Cartan uh, shows how to uh, circumvent that problem. You can do a further extension, uh, which g brings you back to symplectic manifold by putting in another copy of the real line, and that, uh, that copy cor uh, corresponds to an energy variable. And then uh, the Legendre transformation on this extended phase space, you have to complement the formula, this formula, by a formula which, really, uh, which gives you these, this energy variable, and that's precisely the formula that defines the Hamiltonian in terms of the Lagrangian. So this, the symplectic structure that I was um, mentioning before uh, on this extended uh, uh, phase space is now this one, and here you see uh, that energy becomes dual to time, just as position is dual to momentum, and that's what uh, Heisenbergs are uncertainty relation in quantum mechanics, it always relates dual variables, and it's well known that energy and time variables are, are dual in quantum mechanics. So uh, this extension makes every sense from the, even from the point of quantum mechanics. And the contact structure on, that, on this space is, uh, is this expression here, but with the additional T variable. And really, it is these structures that generate a field theory. The T star Q by itself does not generate to field theory. Well, then you have the Euler-Lagrange equations, the Hamiltonian equation standard form. So I only show that. How does that look in field theory, then? You start with space-time manifold. I will call those local coordinates x mu. Has dimension n. You may think of n being equal to 4 although that's not absolutely indispensable. Then you start with a configuration bundle. That's a fiber bundle over space-time, whose fibers are the corresponding to con configuration space and mechanics. Uh, so there you would work with local coordinates of this sort. The x mu is horizontally, the qi is vertically. Velocity space is the jet bundle, which has these local coordinates, and uh, then you dualize. There's also a version uh, I'll comment that in a minute, uh, uh, which uh, linearizes the jet bundle because the jet bundle is only an affine bundle, so you have to linearize. Uh, you can linearize it to consider the associated vector bundle of differences, which looks almost the same. I put an arrow here be for lack of a better notation uh, just to distinguish it because they look the same, but uh, these things have different transformation laws when you change trivialization of the original bundle. And then the Lagrangian appears as a bundle map from the jet bundle to n forms. These n forms here are here for convenience so that you can integrate without having to fix a volume form. You would already incorporate that in the Lagrangian. So locally in coordinates, uh, the standard Lagrangian, uh, this Lagrangian map is uh, the standard Lagrangian function times the, uh, times the volume form of those coordinates. 
And the multi-phase space also comes in two, two variants. You can either take <clears throat> this vector bundle here, the linearized jet bundle, and take its ordinary dual. The, this twisted is that you take an additional tensor product with the volume form bundle on, on space-time. That turns out to be convenient uh, in order not to have to fix volumes, or we don't, we don't have any need for densities in this formalism. The only uh, supposition we will have is that the space-time is orientable, which is a, um, a standard assumption anyway in, in field theory. Otherwise, you go to do two-fold covering. But you can also consider the jet bundle itself, and that has an, um, this affine dual space. Um, there's a notion of a dual of an affine space, and that's a vector space, which is one dimension more than, uh, th than, the, uh, than this one. So this, in fact, <clears throat> this thing here, this extended thing, becomes an affine line bundle over the other. And the Hamiltonian is a section of that line bundle. Okay, this is all pretty standard by now, and I'm mentioning it more or less to fix the ideas because uh, uh, um, this is going to be a standard model of the structures that I'm going to discuss. Okay, this I already said, right? So the fin bundle, the vector bundle, explicitly can be identified with the cotangent bundle of the base times the vertical bundle of the original fiber bundle. So you can see uh, what's the difference here if you could uh, intuitively say the following. If the QIs are the coordinates that accommodate the possible values of the fields, now making the QIs become functions of the X mu is what defines a section of the bundle E, and that's the, field, the basic fields of the theory. Then these coordinates accommodate the possible values of the der derivatives. And these would accommodate the possible values of covariant derivatives. which have a linear transformation law. And the multi-momenta are dual to those. So the formula here is exactly, which is can already be found essentially in the article of Hermann Weyer, is that these multi-momenta are simply the derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the derivatives of the fields the original field to these velocities, but, but these, uh, these derivatives here are now partial derivatives, so you get an additional index, and that just proliferates, and that's why you have the multi-momenta. And there's this additional thing, which is just the same as before. The energy variable is just uh, the Hamiltonian. And here's the standard multisymplectic form, okay, on the, on the dual, on the affine dual, and on the other one, on the linearized, on the dual of the linearized jet bundle, you have something which is analogous to a contact form, which has come to be called a polysymplectic form. So in some sense, multisymplectic is, uh, like, is analogous to symplectic and polysymplectic to contact structures. And they're both there in field theory, unavoidably. Um, you need them both because you have to take the Hamiltonian as a section of one space over the other. Here's the Euler-Lagrange equations and uh, uh, the analog of mechanics and the analog of, Ham of Hamilton's equations are called the de donda weyl equations from the 1930s. We see that the, uh, one part of these equations is this one, which just says that the derivatives of the fields are the derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to the multi-momenta. And here, on the other one, you see, with a minus sign, you see a divergence appearing in the other. So that's, now here you see you didn't choose any sp space-time coordinates. I didn't even choose a metric on space-time. This is completely independent of metrics. This is important because the metric, when you couple to gravity, the metric is a dynamical variable and not a fixed background. Okay, now you can ask, of course, well, the underlying geometric structure, these local formulas, in mechanics you know that cotangent bundles get generalized to symplectic manifolds and even further to Poisson manifolds. And there are other models of symplectic manifolds which are not cotangent bundles, for example, and which are useful. Suryo's uh, sphere, 
was invented to describe cl a classical uh, version of half integer spin. So that's where uh, this approach, the appearance of symplectic manifolds, which are not cotangent bundles, made its appearance in a physically um, undebatably important context. So you can ask yourself, and in field theory, is there something else? These cojet bundles I had there, is there, what is a multisymplectic bundle or a multisymplectic manifold or a polysymplectic structure? And are there other models? which are not of that, that kind. That's the natural question that comes up. And uh, what I want to tell you today is that these answers have been complete, uh, these questions are now completely answered. So let me uh, give you a, a little bit of the history of, about this, uh, uh, about different proposals that have been in the literature on, that, on this subject in, uh, since, well, since the 1930s. Now, as I said before, the local coor in, coor in local coordinates, the, form of, uh, the standard form of a multisymplectic formalism can be traced back to the work of de Donna and Weil in the 1930s. In fact, uh, one of my students found out that the so-called de Donna weil equations appear even before that, namely in a paper by Volterra in the 19th century but uh, unfortunately the name Volterra equation is already occupied, so <laughs> it will have created a lot of confusion. But the historical fact is that uh, I saw that paper of 1890 something uh, where the equation is there, absolutely explicitly. So it's not a new subject so much, right? The basic ideas are, are there since then, since a long time. Globally, well, uh, even in, in the 1960s, when the uh, symplectic formalism really became en vogue, modern, um, basically uh, through the work that uh, culminated in geometric quantization and also Suryo's book, it sort of became popularized. Um, almost, sorry. Almost simultaneously, in the late 1960s and early 1970s, Tolchiev organized a seminar on mathematical physics in Warsaw, and in that group, they already tried um, and made significant progress towards formulating uh, this kind of approach for field theory. And uh, the term multisymplectic, in particular, was coined there. So it's been occupied since around 1970. Um, well, since then, the area has received contributions from many authors. I can just name a few here for lack of time and space. I apologize in advance to, um, for, for any omissions. Yeah. But in, for example, in 1970, we have from the group in Warsaw, Kijowski, Schirba, there, uh, there's a nice paper by Goldschmidt and Sternberg on this. Also, Garcia has worked on that in, in Salamanca. In the 1980s, there have been two proposals that I will have to talk about a little bit later, Gunt, uh, one by Günther and one by Martin. And in the 1990s, well, we have several uh, persons here um, who, um, who have made contributions to this area in that period. Karinina, Krampen and Ebord, Havane, and there's the famous Jim C. paper no, that, <coughs> um, that most, many of you will know. Uh, Professor de Leon has also contributed uh, various papers. There's w one of the earlier ones is, uh, is from the late 1990s. I only, I'm a newcomer in this. I only came, got into this around 2000. Um, and have since then had various collaborators on various aspects of the subject. So uh, here really it becomes very diverse and very hard to track what, what people have been doing in detail. But what a fully satisfactory solution for the, uh, for the uh, def uh, which I, I think is definitive for what these structures uh, uh, might be um, and that I wanted to take the occasion here to convince you of that this is a good proposal and why it is a good proposal. That has only been formulated in 2007, was a PhD thesis of, uh, of a student of mine. 
And uh, it took some time to publish this. The final version has only appeared last year in uh, Reviews in Mathematical Physics, which is a, a journal of mathematical physics that despite its name also publishes res uh, res original research articles. Um, why did it take so long? Uh, I think one important reason is uh, was that uh, for a long time uh, the, in, the central role of space-time. Oh, uh, well, first of all here, uh, the, the difference between what I called ordinary and extended multiphase space uh, was often ignored. Um, if you look at it in, in these cojet bundles, it was, this was overcome. In around 1990, I, I, uh, the first time I read about this was in this paper of Karin in Akrampen and Ebert, and in lecture notes by Mark Gotay. Uh, who really stressed the point that you do both of these works stressed the point that you do that the jet bundle is affine and not linear and that you do have to consider both uh, the, uh, it itself and the linearization and therefore you get two types of duals and you have to work with both of them otherwise you won't get the formalism straight so the uh, still uh, it has taken time many mathematicians have continued uh, in, in the vein and looked at only one of these two structures and the problem is with that is that you uh, are actually you have to model not a single mathematical structure but rather two slightly different ones and including the relation between them. And then also when sometimes you, uh, you see a tendency, uh, I work in, a, I've been working in a mathematics institute for 20 years now since I came to Brazil and often you know, colleagues have a tendency of introducing generalizations of existing co concepts and do the generalization because they find it interesting for its own sake, but they don't uh, really worry uh, so much about, uh, about the, uh, the applications. And the result is that the, uh, in the area there have been ver uh, various different and partly contradictory proposals for mathematical structures and uh, the confusion has gotten a little bit con Babylonic uh, to uh, what you really mean by uh, definite expression. Um, I shall, so let me comment a little bit on this, uh, which is part of the history, because it is important to see in what points these attempts uh, have, un have undoubtable successes and in what, at what points they fail, because only when you recognize that, you can come up with something better. And this will help to put uh, uh, our own proposal into a better perspective. So sometimes you find in the literature the following definition, most naive definition of a multisymplectic form on a manifold, say, oh, sorry. It's used by many authors. It just says a multisymplectic form on a manifold, say, is, is just a, uh, a differential form of higher degree, uh, not just two, but of higher degree, k plus one, let's say. So k equals one is the symplectic case, which is closed and non-degenerate. Non-degenerate means for higher order forms that if you take this musical uh, homomorphism that converts tangent vectors, it now will convert tangent vectors not to fo one forms, but to k forms. So that's not going to be an isomorphism any longer in general. But uh, non-degeneracy means that it's one-to-one, -one, at least. Um, okay, that's a definition. But the problem with that is that you can't prove anything with that. Or in other words, there's no Dabu theorem. So it's much too broad. Um, also, in many cases, as we saw here in, uh, in the field theoretical applications, this manifold is really not just a manifold, but it is fibered over some base manifold. And in most cases, that base manifold is space-time, which is crucial in field theory. Um, that happens for these cojet bundles, for example. And then if you look at the local formulas, you realize that some, you have to put up some horizontality conditions on those differential forms, um, which guarantees that in the local formula for the uh, for, the for, uh, for the omega, you have enough dx's. Uh, let me just uh, go back a moment. When you look at this multisymplectic form, you will notice here. 
it has a lot of dx's. It has n dx's, and uh, this one is n minus one. This means here dnx contracted with a vector field d by dx mu. So it is a form which has at least n minus one dx's and only two possibly other ones. That's a strong restriction, and uh, that's not worked into the usual, def uh, into the naive definition at all. So these horizontality conditions had been neglected in the, uh, largely neglected in the literature, and that makes things go wrong at some point. Let's see where. Okay, that was this item. So conclusion here is this naive definition is not incorrect, but it is incomplete. You need something else. And in fact, to guarantee Darboux's theorem, you need an algebraic condition. Well, in 1988, uh, Martin proposed such an algebraic additional condition, which is the following, that in the t uh, tangent bundle of your manifold, you have a, dis uh, a sub-bundle, a distribution called L, L for Lagrangian, uh, which is isotopic. Now, that means that if you contact it with two vector fields from L, you get zero, and which has a sufficiently high dimension. And he just put up this formula. Uh, in, in fact, he put up combinatorial coefficients, but it amounts to this formula, that the dimension of L is equal to the dimension of the kth exterior power of the annihilator of L, which is the sub-bundle of, of the cotangent bundle of, of P uh, of those forms that vanish on L. That's a canonical concept. You don't need any notion of uh, orthogonal complement or anything of that sort to define that. And for dimensional reasons, it's enough. And that just means that this map that I wrote there before is an isomorphism now. What's the problem with, it? well, what Martin managed to prove, so is that in that case, L is automatic Lagrangian, which means maximally isotopic. And if this k, this number there that measures the degree of the form, now remember k plus one was the degree of the form, if that is larger than one, that is when you are beyond mechanics, that, that L is unique. So that's something completely new. Call it the multi-Lagrangian distribution. We use the definite article the because it's unique. And he managed to prove a Dabo theorem. So that is the merits of his approach. He uh, overcame the problem that you cannot uh, prove anything. He can prove something with that definition. Additional algebraic condition, very nice. Well, the, there's also a problem. Of course, there's a problem, which is uh, uh, that if that, that dimension formula is simply wrong. You can't get anything out of that because if you just count the dimensions on that code, uh, on, on, on the standard model that you have in field three on these cojet bundles, this dimension formula is simply not satisfied. So certainly Martin's definition goes in the right direction, but as it stands, uh, it doesn't apply to the case of interest. Then there's also the polysymplectic story. That is in sort, sort of parallel. That was in 1987. Christian Günther proposed a concept of a polysymplectic form which is, in his approach, simply uh, um, uh, relatively naively a vector value two form, which is closed and non-degenerate. So you just have a bunch of uh, sim of pre-symplectic forms um, whose kernels intersect in zero. But again, non-degeneracy means this. Now the uh, musical homomorphism goes from tangent vectors to cotangent vectors, tensor, this auxiliary coefficient vector space. In fact, uh, it, it's standard here to put an RK here and, uh, call, uh, uh, and, and choose an explicit basis, but as we sh will see, this is not so convenient for the applications to field theory because that uh, amounts to a choice of coordinates in space-time, which you don't have a priori. So you should allow to do coordinate transformations in that space. That's quite essential. Well, again, same problem as before. You can't prove anything. In particular, there's no Dabu theorem for such forms, so uh, not even algebraically. 
Also, it does not contemplate forms of higher degree. And, um, well, as I said, when you get, in particular, when your, your manifold is fibered over some base manifold, as in the case of those cojet bundles uh, where that happens, the form in question is not a form with values in a fixed vector space, but it takes values in a, in a vector bundle, which, in fact, one thing is special about it, that vector bundles obtain over P, right, over this manifold where the form lives, is obtained by, as of a pullback of a vector bundle over M. So on the fibers of P, you have a fixed vector space, but horizontally, you don't. So in that sense, Günther's definition is at the same time too general and at the same time too narrow. Too general because uh, he doesn't have any algebraic condition guaranteeing Darboux's type theorem, and too narrow because uh, there, there are constraints which, uh, um, which should be softened. The first problem was solved in 1992 by Havana, which uh, who proposed an additional algebraic condition, and it's, it can be formulated in the same way as Martin. Existence of a sub of a distribution in the tangent space which is isotropic for that form, and which ha satisfies this dimension formula here. And again, it just means that this injective linear map there that I wrote before is going to be an isomorphism. He calls such forms k-symplectic forms. This k, uh, uh, since we use k for some, something else, because we won't be considering only two forms, but forms of higher degree, and the degree is related to k, uh, this k is the dimension of this auxiliary space here that you put in. That's an external parameter in these forms. Merits, this thing is automatically Lagrangian, maximally isotropic, that is, and is unique. Again, if the um, auxiliary space has at least dimension two, that is, except when you have a single form, there's no such thing as uh, zillions of different Lagrangian subspaces. There's one such subspace, and that's it. And you can prove a Dabut type theorem. But the other problems, so he, he solved one of the problems that uh, were around in, in the de previous definition of Günther, but um, the other uh, problems persist, right? So again, this definition goes in the right direction, but as it stands, it is no longer too general, but it is now only, in quotation marks, too narrow. Well, what's the problem? Well. I would say the basic defect of all the attempts quoted above is that they still ignore the structure of the underlying manifold as the total space of fiber bundle over space-time. Um, in particular, this cannot deal with applications to field theory on curved space-time. So, to incorporate that ex essential extra structure, you have to adapt the definitions. This means that in the multisymplectic case, we must include horizontality conditions, and the polysymplectic case, we may allow for forms of arbitrary degree. We should, I say we should, because in that case, it's not absolutely essential. You could make do with two forms, but you don't gain anything from that restriction. It works in general. But what is more important is that you should admit values that are take uh, in an uh, auxiliary vector space, but in an auxiliary vector bundle over the base. The nice thing is, if you do these modifications, everything comes out right. And the relation between the two versions becomes quite clear. It's contained in a construction that we call the symbol, because it does exactly what you do for a differential operator. You take the highest order term. So what that does, does that look like? In the polysymplectic case, you have this auxiliary vector space. This is the algebraic part because the problem is basically algebraic, not differential. The, condition, the differential condition is d omega is zero and period. There's never anything else. The form is closed. So here you see, uh, I'll go over this relatively quickly here because it's uh, pretty technical. Um, if you wish, you can consult the thing later on of the paper, but the uh, b uh, basic idea is to look at this map again. So if you have a, a, now a, a form which is not necessarily a two-form, you can make it of any degree. Uh, that's practically for free. 
So uh, if you have such a form which takes values in an auxiliary coefficient space, this uh, musical thing will be a map from V to the K forms because you contracted one argument, tensor that space. Um, now you look at subspaces of this, uh, this space that you want to be uh, uh, candidates for this uh, Lagrangian, and so Lagrangian subspace. So what, uh, just remember, what does isotropic mean when you look at this map here? It just means that the subspace is mapped into the, te the tensors here, which uh, lie in the annihilator, no? because uh, this just means that if you contract omega with one element in L, it winds up to be a K form, which is such that when you insert a second, uh, another one from L, you get zero. Maximal isotropic is this condition here, and to make it short, well, it's clear uh, uh, when you put isotropic here, this is also contained in this, so you could reformulate the first condition as the containment in that intersection. That gives nothing new. But it's, it, uh, maximal isotropic means it's equal. Um, that means that if you have a form which sits in the image of this map and annihilates L, then it actually comes from a vector in L. And there's this innocent-looking modification which says you may omit this. That is, any form which uh, is in this space is of, a, of that form. But at the very first moment, you say, well, what, what, what is new about that? But in fact, this, this uh, silly looking modification winds up uh, doing the job. So what you've proved with this definition is so you see that because of that, in this theory, uh, this, uh, the existence of such subspaces is not guaranteed by the existence of maximal isotropic subspaces. Maximal isotropic you always have. But in symplectic geometry, you're used to that fact that, all, uh, that maximal isotropic subspaces are half of the dimension, and they're all, uh, they all have the same dimension. That's not the case here. And sometimes there may be none that satisfies such a relation here. However, if there is such a subspace, then it is unique. You can write an explicit formula for it, and you can compute its dimension, and it's the dimension that comes out is this. Uh, we have here admitted even that omega may be degenerate. So if omega, uh, the usual assumption is that it's, uh, that's what this pre means here. Pre is always when you give up uh, non-degeneracy. Uh, so you will have this additional number. If you think of the polysymplectic, you can forget this number here, and it's just this combinatorial coefficient n over k multiplied by the dimension of the auxiliary space. And conversely, you can prove if you get an isotropic subspace of that high dimension, then it is polylagrangian. And that gives what you call polysymplectic forms. When you, get su when you have such a subspace, which is then uh, the relevant case for field theory will, that it, will be that it is a two-form, but it has this coefficient space. And there's a base theorem here. You can give a standard form where uh, I, won't, I, I will skip this essentially because I want to, give, uh, I, I want to show you the, the, the version for differential forms. That's perhaps more instructive, so we can sort of skip over that. We will get something analogous soon after. This is the algebraic version. For multisymplectic, essentially the same idea works, but there you have to take a space which um, uh, has a, sub, this, uh, a vertical subspace and a, quotient, and a horizontal quotient space. So then you can think about forms being horizontal, that is when you insert enough vertical vectors, then you get zero. The definition Kobayashi no Miso, for example, only uh, contemplates the case that when you uh, that it, you get zero when you contract with a single vertical vector, but you can you can say no, I need 32 vec vertical vectors to give zero and not and not just one, and that gives uh, gives a whole uh, sequence of of, of uh, forms which are ever more more strongly horizontal. The notation here is the following: that uh, if you introduce I mean, the dx's would be something like a basis of the dual here. So uh, a form which has this kind of horizontality condition 
It's a k plus one form, and uh, this r means if you put in more than r vectors, you get zero. And then it is horizontal in this sense. That means uh, if you expand it in a basis, you would get uh, at least this number of dx's, in the, and the uh, the other d's are vertical. Well, here you have the same thing. You look at this contraction map, and uh, then there's the same story as before. Isotropic, maximal isotropic, and Lagrangian is stronger. And the story is the same as before. Uh, such a subspace may or may not exist, but if it does, it is unique and has a dimension which is given by this nice formula. That was new. Um, Nobody had that formula still uh, at that time. Um, and that, in fact, turns out to overcome the problem that Martin had, as you will see in a minute. And conversely, if you have a subspace which is isotropic and has that high dimension, then it is automatically multi-Lagrangian. And that defines these forms. So you see, you have a couple of parameters in this. What are the parameters? Here, for example, there's the degree of the form. There's the degree of horizontality that you fix. The relevant case for field theory is that the form is of degree n plus 1, where n is the dimension of space-time. So in mechanics, you have where space-time is reduced to the time axis, you have just 1. k equals 1, and n, um, n is equal to 1, so k equals 1, and the form is a two-form. In general, if in, in two-dimensional field theory, you would have a three-form in, in the realistic case of four space-time dimensions, the multisymplectic form is of degree five, and so on. And the degree of horizontality is two, that, uh, that is, if you put in more than two vertical vectors, you get zero. Here's a base theorem, let me skip that in the same way. Um, and here's the symbol. That's a, a, an interesting idea. Out of a multisymplectic form, you produce a polysymplectic one. And what is the auxiliary space? The auxiliary space is a space of forms of appropriate degree on the quotient space. Right? So that will vary over manifold then. So, but, okay. I think I will scar over this here. Um, to do this on manifolds, that's the geometric part. The manifolds is, uh, the story is, is the same. You put this algebraic condition in, uh, on these forms and uh, use a Cartan, in the case of a polysymplectic, uh, you will have to use a Cartan calculus for vertical forms. That works perfectly. I'll uh, go over that, I don't have enough time. Um, you have a Cartan calculus, and then the definition is that you have a form which has the fiber-wise, has these algebraic conditions, and is, in this case, vertically closed, and there is an auxiliary vector bundle where it takes values. In the multisymplectic, you have no auxiliary vector bundle. Oh, sorry. The standard model is a model of, is a bundle, oh, sorry is a bundle of forms. You start with a fiber bundle, right? And then you take its vertical bundle, take the dual of that and the kth exterior power of that, and some arbitrary coefficient bundle here, and that gives a standard model of these polysymplectic fiber bundles. And the Kojat uh, bundle is such a case. So, uh, well, a polysymplectic manifold is simply such a fiber bundle whose base manifold reduces to a point, a single fiber. So you can think of the bundles as being just collections of polysymplectic manifolds. In that case, really, the, uh, if you reduce the base to a point, then this uh, vector bundle becomes a vector space. And uh, in case of a two-form, you get back to the definition of Arani, which is therefore included. But uh, the, linear, the dual of the linearized jet bundle is also included, and there's no such thing as a base, which is reduced to a point here. The base is space-time, and the coefficient bundle are the n minus 1 forms on space-time. That's the forms that you integrate over hypersurfaces, like, uh, like currents, to get charges. So the, these forms appear naturally in any conservation law. 
in the multi and here's the uh, local form of them. Um, if you put local coordinates in the base and local coordinates Q's uh, transversal to the Lagrange foliation, then the, the, the uh, this multi poly Lagrange foliation, then the the, uh, the position coordinates are transversal to the foliation. The foliation is generated by these vector fields d by dps, the momentum variables. And the form has this, the differential form. The Dabu, there are Dabu coordinates in which it takes this form. In particular, k equals 1, which was the case of Havana. You have dp, wedge dq, and tensor, some basis in the, uh, in the in a frame field in the auxiliary vector bundle. A multisymplectic case is completely similar. You also have a standard model, which is a bundle of forms over, you start out from a fiber bundle, which is the configuration situation, take its cotangent bundle and take a bundle of forms over that. This construction uh, a special case of this construction I learned from the Jimsey paper. It's in there. It's actually used to define the multisymplectic form there as the exterior derivative of a canonical form. So here's the definition of that canonical form, and the omega is minus d theta. It's the tautological form of the cotangent bundle. So a multisymplectic manifold is a, multi, uh, is a fiber bundle whose base is reduced to a point. But, uh, and then the horizontality condition, in fact, becomes void, and you get back the definition of Martin. But in field theory, the basis is not a point. And that's why the Martin's definition wasn't adequate. You need a different basis. There, it is the bundle that is in the Jimsey paper. Okay, Dabu coordinates give you a local formula which generalizes that, which you saw before in the case of, that is of relevance to field theory. So now we have a sort of general theory which comprises the previous proposals. Uh, it has more parameters, free parameters, like the degree of the form, degree of horizontality, the structure of the auxiliary vector bundle. That is up to your choice, right? But the whole theory works. Darboux's theorem is guaranteed. You have the standard local forms. and. Um, to conclude, I would like to uh, so, uh, only mention the following. The answer to what is more recent, oh, there's the symbol. You have a standard way of producing a, um, out of a multisymplectic form a polysymplectic form. And that is this, uh, this structure that leads you from this formula to that formula. Here you take, in this case, it's the lowest order term with the least number of dx's, which survives, and you throw the other one away and replace this wedge product here by a tensor product. So in local coordinates, it's just that, but it's a global construction. Okay, that uh, there are some integrability theorems. Usually, in, uh, if the auxiliary space is at least three-dimensional, the uh, multi-Lagrange or poly-Lagrange bundle is automatically integrable in two Whereas it's not the case, so you get, a, but in, generically you get a foliation. And that's, of course, um, well, I won't show the rest here because time is not sufficient, but more recently we have, uh, there has been a PhD thesis, uh, another PhD thesis by a student of mine, where we have uh, looked at the question of connections on these, on these uh, bundles, and the question if there is any um, poly or multisymplectic fiber bundles different from those standard models that I showed you before. So the connections are completely classified. It's the same theorem as for simpl in symplectic geometry. You uh, have a classification of what connections exist. That there is always connections which preserve these structures and they form an affine space which you can write as a tensor space. I have, um, there, what hap appears there is this Young diagram because the form is now of higher degree. So you get certain tensor fields which have rank k plus 2 and they, uh, they uh, transform according to this irreducible representation of the group sk plus 2 and that gives a complete classification of, the, uh, of all possible 
poly and multisymplectic connections. Well, multisymplectic is the same theorem here. And finally, um, all these connections reduce to what one could call the but connection on this uh, canonically given multi or poly Lagrangian subbundle, you have a canonical connection. Any poly or multisymplectic connection restricted to L gives the same connection, which is the but connection. That is flat and torsion free, and therefore the, the leaves of this foliation are all flat affine manifolds. And that gives, uh, give, leads you directly to, a, to, in this theory, to a, uh, to a complete analog of the polysymplectic and multisymplectic version of Einstein's tubular neighborhood theorem from uh, symplectic geometry, which tells you essentially that if you have such a Lagrangian foliation there and you take a transversal section, then locally in a neighborhood of that section, uh, uh, the manifold looks like a cotangent uh, neighborhood of the zero section of a cotangent bundle. The same theorem holds here in this uh, really very much more general context. And the same, uh, what we, uh, was uh, more difficult was to adapt the proof, which uh, some of the proofs in the literature of this, they required a certain amount of um, uh, artificial additional constructions and we sort of had to f figure out whether it was possible to get rid of those tools and just to restrict to the tools we really had and when we managed to do that, we found that the generalization was obvious. Well, I didn't get to the end. I didn't hope to, really. <laughs> it's a lot of material. I couldn't say anything about the covariant functional formalism. Um, if at the very end, let me say, what is open outlook? Next. Well, this is still an area in its infancy. What we are working on now is how to deal with symmetries and conservation laws. After all, this formalism has to have Noether's theorem, has to be here. It's given in any field theory uh, book. You have Noether's theorem. So we were, uh, but here in this context, it should be adapted by using Lie groupoids and algebraids to describe the transformations of um, that, uh, the symmetry transformation. First steps have been taken. Um, uh, and uh, I think by, uh, well, about that, um, what comes out of this, uh, we'll have to wait for the next conference, okay? Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. And at the very end, there is, thank you, and happy birthday. I brought something from my... So, question and comment? Since, Jair, you uh, have been on cellular motility, um, I, I thought of what on a birthday could I bring along as a little present. And I, I remembered that when my daughter did an, uh, is presently doing an animation course, and uh, so uh, this is not exactly cellular motility, but virtual motility. So that was one of the little exercises she did. Happy birthday, Jaya. <laughs>